sermon title this morning is Walk by Faith. Walk by Faith. And we come again to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and specifically to verses 6 through 10. So each Lord's Day now, as we've been working through, verse by verse, through Paul's second canonical letter to the church at Corinth, uh, in the context of this letter, and for reasons previously discussed, ground well trod on, so to speak, Paul has launched into a defense of his ministry. And not just a defense of his ministry, but a rich and beautiful commendation of his ministry, a ministry that is blessed by God. And not only his ministry, right, but all Christian ministry, Christian mission as a whole. We as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, have been given a glorious treasure. And it is God's grace and God's mercy to God's people, not only to be saved through the means of that glorious treasure, but to be laborers in it, to be laborers with it, to be stewards of that treasure. Now, however, as we've already seen through the example of Paul, preeminently through the example of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, that ministry is often fraught with difficulty. We preach the gospel in a world that hates it. We stand for righteousness in a world that is striving to suppress that righteousness, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And there is a Christian counterfeiter on virtually every corner, some snake oil salesman who is willing to sell you a placebo, right? Selling a placebo to the masses. And so, as Peter would say, don't be surprised, beloved. Right? Don't be surprised. Don't think it's strange when the fiery trial comes upon you. Ministry, Christian ministry, is often fraught with difficulty. Paul's ministry was marked by near constant hardship. In chapter 4 here, verse 11 he was always being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. And like Paul, you and I are going to face hardship as well in Christian ministry. When you're faithful, you're going to face hardship. All those who desire to live godly in this present age will suffer persecution. If you've been here long enough, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There will be sometimes fear. There will be doubt. There may at times be laziness. There may at times be apathy. There's going to be rejection on the part of the world. There's going to be hostility. Those that will revile you and persecute you and speak all manner of evil against you falsely for his name. However, in the midst of this, in the midst of those circumstances, Paul describes the Christian ministry as a mercy from God. Paul says we don't preach ourselves, but we preach Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves slaves for his sake. We have a glorious hope, Paul says, and so we use great boldness of speech. We don't lose heart, Paul says. We are always confident, always of good courage. Now, on the one hand, Paul makes these statements and serves with this kind of confidence on the basis of faith, right? We can serve with confidence on the basis of faith in Christ. As Paul has done it, following his example, Philippians chapter 3, we must do the same, right? Paul, follow Paul's example. Paul believed Christ. He had faith in Christ, and he believed what Christ had done for him. If you're saved, if you're here today, you've turned from sin to put your faith in Christ, you've been forgiven, you've been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, if you're saved, the Lord laid down his life so that you could be forgiven. The Lord died in your place, bearing the wrath that you deserve so that you could be declared righteous, so that you could be reconciled to God. Peter says that he, Christ, he himself, bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. Paul lives and serves on the basis of faith in Christ. On the other hand, Paul makes these statements in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 particularly, and he serves in Christian ministry with this kind of confidence on the basis also of faith in Christ, but faith in what Christ has secured for him. 
the hope, the blessings of God purchased or secured by Christ at the cross. Hope is simply faith in Christ for the future, right? We've been delivered to a living hope. Now, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, here's Paul's basic line of reasoning, if you will, from our text. Right? His basic line of reasoning. In chapter 4, affliction in this life is light and momentary. Affliction, our circumstances, light and momentary, but it is producing for us an exceeding and eternal weight of glory. But because my hope, because my future is there, I can wear myself out in service to Christ here, right? I am free to wear myself out living for him in the present because of my hope, my faith in Christ for the future. Does that make sense? What and who I treasure is in heaven. So that's where my heart is also. And because my hope, because my future is there with him, I am free to live for him while I'm here. Peter says again in this way, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, he says, God in Christ has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A living hope in an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away. It is reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith. There in 1 Peter chapter 1 then, knowing these things, right? Knowing this good, solid theology. How does Peter then charge us to respond to that hope? Peter says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. In other words, as we think about these things, our future in him should have a tremendous impact on our present, right? It is the future. It is our future hope, those blessings secured for us by Christ that invades the present and should affect how we think, should affect how we live, should affect how we conduct ourselves, right? And how we live now, if you think about that, how we live now gives evidence of where our hope, where our future is. Locating our hope, locating our heart where it belongs in heaven will fuel and will drive our service to him now. We're to consider these things as we serve the Lord in ministry. It'll affect us, right? It affects how we think. Joy in ministry, the strength to persevere, even in the midst of difficult circumstances, joy, strength, Perseverance, hope, is found in laying hold of that hope that we have in Christ. Now, Paul beautifully expresses that truth in our text, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Specifically now, in verses 6 through 7, it produces in Paul a bold trust. Look at verse 6. So we are always confident, always having courage, so to speak, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. In verse 8, that truth fuels a bold hope. Paul says in verse 8, we are confident, yes, and well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Right? To be absent from this body and present with Him is far better. And in verse 9, that leads to a bold ambition. Therefore, verse 9, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Now this morning, as we come to verse 10, that future hope of the Christian, right? our hope of being raised with Christ, our hope of fellowship, communion, un fettered by sin, our communion with him in heaven, that future hope is undergirded. It is supported. You could say in verse 10, it is protected from being presumptuous or vain or empty or shallow through the use of a warning that we see in verse 10. 
You see that? Our future hope, our faith, if you will, supported, protected from being presumptuous by the use of a warning in verse 10. Look at verse 10 with me. For, verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Paul's bold ambition in verse 9 is now supported by a bold motivation in verse 10. A bold motivation in verse 10. So here now is the flow of Paul's argument beginning with verse 6. Right? Paul says, beginning at verse 6, listen, we're always courageous in our ministry for Christ. We're always confident. Paul says, always bold. We're courageous, confident, or bold knowing that our death here simply ushers us into the bliss of his presence in heaven forever. In fact, our great desire is by far, is rather to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, having that great desire, therefore we always strive to be well-pleasing to him. Why? Why? Because being present with him also involves being judged by him. Verse 10. Right? What we do, how we live, matters in the end. It matters to Christ. It should matter to us. We must all appear before him in judgment. And notice with me how our response to this text, right? think with me how we should respond to this text. And think how our response to this text then is hemmed in from both sides for our good. This is the grace of God, right? The way that the Lord does this. Both sides equally displaying the grace of God to us. Brother, sister, listen, our response to this text from the last two Lord's Days and today, studying this text together, our response should be this. Listen, be courageous. <laughs> be bold. Be fervent. Be zealous. Be earnest in your diligence. Show great diligence in your ministry preaching the gospel. Right? Show great diligence in your ministry to one another, loving your brother, serving your brother in Christ. Do that for the Lord's sake. Why? Because on the one hand, look at what Christ has done for you. Right? What Christ has done for you. He laid down his life for you. You also, therefore, lay down your life for him. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow him. He has laid up for you treasure in heaven. You have producing, even now in your afflictions, an exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Focus your eyes on unseen things eternal in the heavens. And on the other hand, right? Both for our good. Both a grace of God to us. God is not to be trifled with. Our God is a consuming fire. And it is He to whom you must give an account. He is holy. As Peter says, so you be holy in all your conduct. As it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Standing before the judgment seat of Christ, our desire should be to have a favorable assessment. Amen? To hear those words of his, right? Well done, good and faithful slave. Our aim then, our preeminent ambition, as it was for Paul, should be then in this life or in the life to come, to live a life that is well-pleasing to him. To live a life that is well-pleasing to him. One commentator said this, While believers are righteous in Christ by faith alone, the faith that justifies is to be expressed by love and obedience and by pleasing the Lord. Our confidence that, will we, be, that we will be with the Lord, verse 8, is to be held in tension with the fear of the Lord, in verse 11, from which we serve Him. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Notice that from both sides, right? Right? Promise and warning, blessing and warning, both of those for our good, both of those the grace and mercy of God to us, both of those intended to motivate us in the work, to labor, to strive, to exercise ourselves toward godliness, not to grow weary in well-doing, right? To be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our work is never in vain in the Lord. I want to unpack this statement of Paul in verse 10 under three headings, under three headings. First, our requirement. 
Second, our recompense. And thirdly, our response. Our requirement, our recompense, and our response. Notice with me first at the beginning of verse 10, our requirement. Our requirement. Verse 10 begins, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That word must, often used in Scripture to convey a divine necessity. A divine necessity. Events or actions determined by God. Events or actions that will occur with absolute certainty. Events or actions that must occur. Jesus uses the same word in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, where there he began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. You see that? He must suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. He must. There's no, array, there's no way around this divine appointment. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's no legal technicality that you can exploit. There's no loophole. There's no excuse that you can give. There's nowhere, so to speak, nowhere to hide. No corner that you can crawl into. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, if we use a metaphor here of a court hearing, those who are the judged in verse 10 are the we all. The we all. Now, it's clear from the context, verse 10, that the we all of verse 10 is referring to believers. Not only unbelievers will face the judgment of God. Believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In context, look at verse 6. We are always confident. Verse 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 9. We... Make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him. Verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We're talking about believers here, right? Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. He's writing to us by implication. Because Paul specifically mentions here believers in this text, does that then exclude unbelievers? Absolutely not. Right? The Bible clearly teaches, teaches that we all will appear in judgment. It is appointed for men once to die, and then the judgment. Listen, it is appointed for men, plural, to die once, and then the singular judgment. The parable of the dragnet in Matthew 13 highlights this. I think one text of many that speak of this. Where there, the parable says, The kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind. Which, when the dragnet was full, they drew it to shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. There the Lord says, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, they will separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire, where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Revelation 11, verse 18, speaks of the coming day of judgment. When speaking of Christ there in Revelation 11, 18, he says, Your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers, or those who bring moral ruin upon the earth. It's a day where both believers and unbelievers will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment seat of the great judge, the Lord Jesus Christ. As I live, the Lord says, every knee, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue confess to God. In the day of judgment, no one is excluded. All men, believers and unbelievers, will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. However, as we consider that day, that day takes on distinctively different characters depending upon which of those two groups you fall into. 
Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul is speaking to fellow saints, fellow believers in Christ. So now if we, if we continue the metaphor of a court hearing, then in verse 10, the divine courtroom where we must appear houses, in verse 10, the judgment seat of Christ. The Greek word for judgment seat is the word bema. The word refers to, originally referred to just a step of your foot, a step, right? It came to be known or used for, over time, a series of steps. In this case, it's a series of steps by which someone ascends to a raised platform where there is a seat of authority. In this case, the judgment seat of Christ. In Matthew 27, Pilate sat on the Bema seat, the judgment seat where he presumed to judge Christ before his crucifixion. In Acts 25, Festus takes his seat at the Bema to render a verdict with respect to Paul. Here it is the judgment seat of Christ. So now in our metaphor of the court hearing, right, we have the location of our hearing, the judgment seat of Christ. We see those who are judged. It is we all, believers, all of us who are in Christ. Lastly, we see the judge himself. It is the judgment seat of Christ. He is the one. Christ is the one to whom all judgment has been given. All judgment has been committed to God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember with me John chapter 5, verse 22, right, where the Lord says, The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. But this doesn't mean in judgment that God himself is excluded. Jesus Christ, God the Son, is the means through which God judges, if you will. Romans chapter 2 verse 16 says that God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Right? In Romans chapter 14, it's the judgment seat of God there, as it is here, the judgment seat of Christ. I think Acts 17.30 is helpful. Listen to Acts chapter 17 verse 30. Truly... These times of ignorance, God has overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Verse 31. Because he has appointed a day on which he, God, will judge the world in righteousness by the man, Jesus Christ, whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So this is our divine appointment. Right? This is our divine requirement. Verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, continuing our metaphor, right? If we're in the court hearing, think with me for a moment. This wouldn't be a trial, per se. This wouldn't be a trial where you are presumed innocent or presumed, yeah, presumed innocent unless proven guilty. This is not a trial, right? This is after your death. It's after that determination has already been made, right? Guilt or innocence, if you will, has already been determined. You have either been declared righteous in Christ, or you have been condemned already because you have not believed in the Son of God. Therefore, the judgment seat of Christ is not a trial as much as it is for the wicked, a sentencing hearing. It's a sentencing hearing. For the wicked, this will be the hearing before you are dragged away to have your sentence executed. For the believer, the judgment seat involves then rewards. The judgment seat of Christ will involve either rewards or retribution. Rewards or retribution. And we've considered our requirement. In light of rewards and retribution, notice next, point two, our recompense. Our recompense, back in verse 10. The text reads, from we, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now remember again, Paul is specifically speaking here to believers, right, believers. Now consider with me, brother, sister, you and I will appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that you and I may be judged for our works. Do we get that? 
so that you and I may receive recompense. To receive payback, if you will. To receive the wages of what we have done in the body, whether good or bad. We will appear before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged according to our works, and we will receive recompense there. We will, divine necessity, we must give an account. Paul's ambition, then, to live a life that's well-pleasing to him, when he says that, right? Our aim is to live a life that is well-pleasing to him. That ambition was fueled, was motivated by the fact, certainly motivated by the promises of God, right? Certainly motivated by what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for him, but also here motivated by the fact that he would one day stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account for what he's done in his body, whether good or bad, right? Give an account in this life for what he's done in this life. The word there in verse 10, for appear, is the Greek word phanerao. It carries the sense, not merely of being there, not merely of being physically present, but of being revealed or being exposed. The word is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, where Paul says, The Lord, when he comes, will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal, phanerao, the counsels of the hearts. He'll reveal... Or expose the counsel of our hearts. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. There is no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You may may think in this life that you can put on a good appearance. Right? Right? We've known those. There may be some of you here today that are playing the hypocrite. Right? You put on a good face. You make a good showing. You say the right things. Maybe you do the right things. You play the part well. You can hide your hypocrisy behind a veneer of church things. (laughs) behind a veneer of being friendly. But that's not going to work at the judgment seat of Christ. At the judgment seat of Christ, you are exposed. You are laid bare. Your heart, your mind, your motives, your intentions, your deeds, your words are exposed naked before him. The one who is a consuming fire, the one with whom you must give an account. In that day, at the judgment seat of Christ, your works will be manifest as works done in faith, in the power of His Spirit, or your works will manifest. You have a heart that doesn't know Him. You Do not love him. You have not served him. It'll reveal your faith to be a sham. Do you see? It's there before the Lord Jesus Christ that your works, your thoughts, your deeds will be exposed and they will be judged in verse 10 according to whether they are good, meaning useful, worthy, beneficial, Or whether they are bad, meaning worthless, wrong, or evil. As we think about this, right? As we think about this, is this causing you any sense of concern? No, we, 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 rightfully, right, rightfully, we dwell on our justification. We think about the blessings that we have in Christ. We praise God for having saved us having forgiven us, rightfully so, right? So when we then talk about facing Christ at his judgment seat, believers, delivered, redeemed, facing Christ in judgment, does that make you uncomfortable? Does that pose any concern to you? It should, right? It should concern you. It concerned Paul. 
It was the motivation by which or through which Paul desired then to live a life that is well-pleasing to Christ. Certainly the promises, right? Certainly the blessings that were his in Christ. But also here, verse 10, the fact that he would face the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. We've considered our requirement. But we've considered the recompense. What then should be our response? What then should be our response? You and I, like Paul, should be extremely concerned. Should be extremely concerned. In fact, it should be our preeminent ambition, our singular aim while in this body to live a life that is well-pleasing to him. As a begrudging duty, out of slavish fear of condemnation, no. It's our delight. Our delight. We should want, we should desire to live a life that is well-pleasing to him. Peter says it this way, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. And if you call on the Father, listen, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, then conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. As Peter there in 1 Peter chapter 1, is he speaking of a slavish fear of death? Not if you're in Christ, he's not. Not if you're in Christ. Should we be fearful of losing our salvation? Should we be fearful in that day, standing at the judgment seat of Christ, should we be fearful of condemnation? Not if you're in Christ. Not if you're in Christ. However, and again, thinking of a proper balance here, however, we know, right? Think about what Peter says. If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing, right? Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. So while we consider these things, we know, don't we, that we not only relate to Christ as Savior, but we also relate to him as Lord and judge. As much as he is our Savior, we will stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. And we know, we know that we were not redeemed with corruptible things, but we were redeemed with his own precious blood. For this reason, therefore, what does Hebrew says? Let us have grace, right? We need grace. We must labor to avail ourselves of that grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. In and of ourselves, how much can we do? Nothing. That's right. Nothing. We need grace. We need mercy. Our God is not to be trifled with. We will appear before him at the judgment seat of Christ. He is Savior, but he is also Lord and Judge. Now, what grace here are we referring to? What grace is it that we need to stand in as we consider these things? What particular grace of God, think with me, what particular grace of God should enable us to stand before the judgment seat of Christ without fear of condemnation? What particular grace of God should allow us to stand before him with joy inexpressible in that day? Paul refers to it as the grace of justification. It's the grace of justification. Look with me at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Now, if you have turned from your sin, right, if you've put your faith and trust in, in Christ, then you enter the courtroom of heaven, you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, not as a condemned sinner, 
But you stand at the judgment seat of Christ justified, having a right standing with God by faith in Christ. Right? We need to stand in that grace. Look at verse 1, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, Paul says here, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? Praise the Lord. Prior to justification, there is no peace with God. Prior to justification, there is no peace with God. God is holy. God is just and you are not. Right? You are guilty. You are condemned before him. You are worthy only of his righteous wrath, which will be poured out on ungodly sinners for all eternity in the fires of hell. That's what we deserve. Right? God is holy. You and I are sinners. Condemned. Now that's the context. That context is the context in which God provides them the grace of justification. Why? It's through the grace of justification through which we can be reconciled to him. It's the grace through which God reconciles us to himself. Through faith in the person and work of his only begotten son, God imputes or he credits, he reckons our sin to Christ and he imputes or he credits or he reckons the righteousness of Christ to us. Right? This is a great exchange. The great exchange. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I remember Romans chapter 3, right? Romans chapter 3, the whole world before the law of God is guilty. The whole world has their mouths clamped shut before the law of God. They are guilty. They are condemned unrighteous, right? But what does God say? There is a righteousness of God that is revealed. And it's revealed in Christ, revealed in the gospel. It is the righteousness of Christ that is imputed to one who puts their faith and trust in Christ so that they can be declared righteous in him, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the grace of justification, by virtue of Christ's perfect righteousness, which is ours by faith, God declares his own. Declares those who put their faith and trust in Christ, he declares us righteous. That's a miracle, isn't it? Christ as our representative, if you will. Christ as our substitute. Having bore the wrath, the penalty for our sin, having perfectly lived a sinless life, Without guilt, blameless before the law of God, Jesus Christ, his righteousness is imputed or credited or reckoned to us. So that we then stand before God without guilt, blameless before the law of God, blameless in Christ. This is not a work of God in a person. Right? This is a declaration of God about a person. Is a declaration. It's a proclamation of God. Justification is a legal declaration of acquittal. You are acquitted before the judgment seat of Christ. You are acquitted. Acquittal before the law. You're acquitted, cleared, right? Acquittal eliminates. Any possibility of condemnation, it eliminates condemnation. These, are, these two are opposites. Condemnation being a legal declaration of guilt. Justification being a legal declaration of righteous, acquitted, innocent. What does it all mean now? What, is it, what does all this mean? It means this, brother, sister. Listen, no believer will ever be called upon to render any judicial payment or experience any judicial suffering for any of his sins for all of time. Hallelujah. His debt has been paid 
at the cross forever. Forever. Peter would, or Paul, would later ask, rhetorically, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Right? It is God who justifies. God has justified those who have put their faith and trust in Christ. Therefore, chapter 5, verse 1, having been justified by faith, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, through whom? Through Christ. Also, now, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. The grace of justification by faith, right? We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Boy, can you see how this should affect how you think, how you live, how you worship, how you serve, how you pray? Mercy. Can you think, can you see right, how this should be a cause of joy inexpressible rather than Fear of condemnation rather than going before the judgment seat of Christ in fear. Can you see how going before the judgment seat of Christ is a time of rejoicing, a time of confidence, a sober time, certainly, but a sober joy (laughs) because of all that you've done? No way. No way. Because of all that he's done. Right? Because of all that he's done. Because of where we've placed our hope. Because of him in whom we have placed our trust. It can be a time of joy. Listen, unless you lay hold of this truth by faith in Christ, you'll be miserable in your Christian life. You're going to be miserable. You'll have your eyes Laser focused in on your own inward corruption. You'll have your eyes off the Lord then. Your walk by faith then comes to a screeching halt as you become morbidly and despairingly introspective over over your sin. We will be weak. We will be wavering. What happens when you take your eyes off Christ by faith? What happens when you stop walking in the Spirit, when you stop walking by faith? Your sanctification comes to a screeching halt, right? Your joy shrivels up. Your strength dries up. We will be weak and wavering and wandering and restless and fearful and doubting and despairing. We will be miserable in the Christian life, quote unquote. Unless we lay hold of this glorious truth and live by it. Amen. We need access by faith into the grace of justification. The Christian is going to sin. You've sinned today. I've sinned today. You will sin every day. The Christian is going to sin. How do you, how do I relate to that sin? Certainly we repent. We repent of sin. We turn from sin. We endeavor to live a life that is well-pleasing to Him. The Christian often fails miserably. The Christian often falls woefully short of our calling, right? When we've done all that we can do, When we've done all that we can do, we can at best say that we are unprofitable servants. We've done what was only our duty to do. So how do I relate to God with respect to my sin? With respect to this condition that we find ourselves in on this side of eternity? How does he relate to me? How does he look upon me? How does he consider me? How can I be joyful and confident knowing that I will face him 
who is infinitely holy in judgment. I must live day by day by faith in Christ with the understanding, living in light of the fact that by faith in Christ, the day of my judgment as it pertains to punishment for my sin has come and gone. There was a judgment seat at the cross. Praise God. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. My sins, past, present, and future, have been dealt with decisively and fully and finally. I have a standing with God through Christ based upon his perfect obedience, where I am not only declared innocent of breaking the law, but righteous as though I had fulfilled every part of it. Christ has come as my substitute. Christ has come as my representative. And now through Christ, I have, present tense, peace and acceptance with God. I can now, as Peter says, I can now rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know, can someone falsely claim all this, right? Can someone sit back and say, yep, that's me too, me too, right? And their heart be devoid of the things of God? Yes, they can. Well, aren't you concerned, right, that as we talk about this in the way that we talk about it, that someone's going to do that? Don't you think that this kind of talk might embolden a sinner? Yeah, but that's not our concern. Paul is speaking here to believers. <laughs> they are going to give an account of themselves before God. And this is the truth, the grace of God, in which believers, you and I, brothers and sisters, must stand. We must have access by faith to this grace. And we need it minute by minute, don't we? To live in light of this grace and mercy. Paul goes on in Romans 5, look at verse 3. Not only that, Paul says, but we also glory in tribulations. We glory in them. <laughs> Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So while you labor to live a life that's well-pleasing to him, right? While you strive to conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear, remember the glorious grace of your justification in Christ and rejoice, right? God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you, right? Who can be against you? It is God who justifies. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? There is no case against you that can stand does that mean that you can get away with wallowing in your sin like a pig nope no way in spanish no way jose all right the extent of my spanish <laughs> can't get away with it you can't like a dog return day by day to consume that same vomit that would merely prove that your faith is not genuine, right? That you aren't a possessor of that grace of justification. And you need to turn from your sin and trust Christ. So this appearance then, if we're considering again, back in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If this appearance before the judgment seat of Christ with respect to my works is not about punishment... Not about condemnation. Then what is it about? What is it about? The judgment seat of Christ with respect to believers. A judgment that pertains to the works that we've done in the body, whether good or bad. Is a judgment about ratification or reward. Ratification or reward. Ratification. Our faith 
is confirmed. James says perfected, right? Confirmed. Our faith is confirmed or perfected by our works. Our faith evidenced by our works. Our faith proven by our works. James says, show me your faith. (laughs) As if you could. Can't show me your faith, James surmises, without works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Works, good works, ratify the genuineness, if you will, of our faith. It's an illustration of this. Um, 1 Kings chapter 3. And uh, if you remember from that passage, we don't have time to go there. Uh, Solomon. Solomon has taken the throne. And uh, Solomon was given an opportunity, a glorious opportunity by God. You know, Tell me, Solomon, what I should give you. Solomon, rather than asking for riches, rather than asking for all that wealth, rather than asking for uh, his enemies to be defeated at his hand, Solomon asks for wisdom, right? Solomon asks for wisdom. So Solomon is sitting on the throne, sitting on the judgment seat, so to speak, and a case is brought before him. And it's a case where two women uh, each had a child, apparently living together in the same house, and each woman sleeping there with the baby on the bed. And one woman in the middle of the night rolls over on top of her baby, and the baby dies, suffocates. Right? So women, ladies with babies, be careful. Um, the lady rolls over, and the baby suffocates. So she gets up, knowing that her baby has died, and switches her dead child with the living child of the other woman in the house. She trades places. So the, the other woman then, they wake up in the morning, the other woman um, sees the baby, The baby is dead, and upon holding the baby, inspecting the baby, she comes to realize that the baby is not hers, and that the other woman has kidnapped, has taken her child. So this case comes before Solomon then. case is brought before Solomon. There's this back and forth. It looks like on the surface to be a he said, she said, or a she said, she said kind of a situation. And so Solomon, in Great wisdom, right? He became renowned for his wisdom. Solomon says, bring me a sword. This is in First Kings chapter 3, if you want to read it there. Solomon says, bring me a sword. Divide the living child in two and give half to each mother. Instantaneously, the one who was the real mother of the child, why? Because she loved the child, Right? cries out to Solomon, no, 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 let her take the baby. Let her take the baby, right? And through that, Solomon, through her love for the child, her love for the child proved that she was the genuine mother. Does that make sense? Solomon was looking for confirmation. He was looking for confirmation of who the real mother was. There's a sense in which that illustrates the believer before the judgment seat of Christ, right? Our faith is proven or manifested to be sincere, manifested to be genuine by our works, by the things that we've done in the body, (laughs) by those things we've done in the power of his spirit. You stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat, and Jesus Christ looks at you and says, wow, look at all of your works, how Good they are. And this, oh, this thing over here you did. Wow, that's really, I'm impressed with that. Right, come, you blessed of my father. Enter the kingdom prepared for you. No, right, that's not how it goes, right? Apart from the work of his spirit, apart from, apart from faith in Christ, anything that we do is sin. <laughs> no, but God looks upon the believer, looks upon the believer's faith, which is a gift of God, strengthened and supplied by his spirit. He looks at those works that are done in faith by the strength that is supplied by his spirit. He sees those works as evidence of the genuineness of our faith or those works as proving, manifesting the genuineness of our faith. And it's on that basis of good works that we are then. Our justification, you could say, is confirmed. Our faith is confirmed. He Our works prove the sincerity of our faith. Does that make sense? There's another example, ratification. Look with me at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2.
We've got to trust the Lord for these things, right? Obey the Lord. Serve Him fervently, diligently. Right? Strive to live a life that is pleasing to Him. We trust Him. Right? Romans chapter 2. Look at verse 5. Speaking of this judgment as well. But, chapter 2, verse 5, in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, speaking here to unbelievers, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. By the way, if you turn from Christ today, if you walk out those doors without putting your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then this condemnation hangs over your head at all times. You are treasuring up for yourself. The longer that you remain impenitent, the harder that your heart becomes. You are treasuring up for yourself wrath of the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to you according to your works. Verse 7, look. Eternal life... To those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Now on the surface, doesn't it make that look doesn't that make it look like salvation is by works, not by grace through faith? And it looks like we're saved by works. It's not what's being communicated there, right? These works are manifest evidence of genuine saving faith, right? Those who have put saving faith in Christ, repentant faith in Christ, are those who, with patient continuance in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Do you see? The seeking of glory, honor, and immortality give evidence that we put our faith in Christ. Verse 8. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. And you see how also how this just destroys any notion today of easy believism or merely a decisional regeneration, a, a, a decision of man's will to say, I believe in Christ, and then to go and to live however you want to live, Right? To then to go and go back to your sin, back to your vomit, back to your wallowing in the mire, it just destroys that. Genuine saving faith will produce works of faith, guaranteed. There's a sense in which, speaking of the judgment seat of Christ, that that judgment for believers involves ratification or confirmation of genuine saving faith, right? But it also involves, for believers, it involves reward, it involves reward. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul says this, He who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, the things that he's done in the body, right? Each will receive his own reward. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 8, Paul says this, Whatever good thing one does, each one does, this he will receive back. That's recompense, right? He will receive back from the Lord. And we remember, don't we, the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents is an example of that, right? This idea in the judgment, at the judgment seat of Christ of reward. There was a man who went into a far country, and he gave, in Luke chapter 19, gave each of his servants, each of his three servants, ten minas, Right? Gave them ten minas. And so the three servants then, while he was away, were supposed to uh, labor to expand or increase uh, their allotment. And so the one with ten minas, when the master came back after a delay, the master comes back and the one with ten minas, minas goes to him and says, Look, master, your ten minas, I've produced ten more. So what does the master say to that servant? Well done, good and faithful servant. Right? The one who was given five minas comes back says, look, master, lesser amount. All right, we give him 10 minas. He comes back and says, your 10 minas, I've produced five more. What does the master say at his producing five minas? He says the same thing, doesn't he? Well done, good and faithful slave. 
part of that goes to show you that it's not always results, but it's the faithfulness with which we serve. Be faithful with what you've been given, right? Seek to serve him. Strive to live a life that is well-pleasing to him. Use what you've been given. The last servant, given also 10 minas, comes back, had the 10 minas wrapped in a tissue, and he hands it back to the master. He says, I know that you were an austere man, so here's your 10 minas back. And what does the Lord do to that fruitless professor? Not a possessor of faith, but a professor of faith. The Lord says to that man, or to the reapers, to the angels, to throw him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, there's no such thing as fruitless faith. No such thing as fruitless faith. He then takes that man's ten minas, and he gives those to the man who already had minas. In other words, he gives him a reward. He's rewarded for his faithfulness, for his diligence. Parable of the talents. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's see this in Paul's writings there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This idea of reward, ratification and reward, reward at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look down at verse 9. Paul says here, verse 9, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. There will be those that come behind Paul that will build on that foundation. But Paul warns then, let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can, be, can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. Why? For the day, the day of judgment, the day that we appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Paul specifically here speaking of believers, right? Believers who are serving the Lord. Here, Paul's serving in apostolic ministry. There will be those who will come behind him serving in pastoral ministry. But all of us, all Christians serve in some capacity in Christian ministry, right? Verse 14. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. Verse 15. If anyone's work is burned he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so is through fire. Think about verse 15. He will suffer loss. What is the loss that he suffers? It's not the, the loss of justification. <laughs> right? It's not the loss of eternal life. This is not salvation. And we're speaking of reward. He loses the reward that he would have received had his Work been precious stones and not wood, hay, or stubble. That makes sense? He will suffer loss. The loss of what? The loss of the reward. If anyone's work, verse 14, uh, endures, he receives a reward. But if anyone's work is burned, he suffers loss. The loss of that reward. He himself will be saved, though, yet as through fire. We can, at the judgment seat of Christ, suffer loss. Be diligent, brother. Be diligent, sister to labor, to strive, to live a life that is well-pleasing to him. Be fervent. We have the greatest motivations. Why? Right? What the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you and I, what is promised to us in the gospel, the justification that is ours in him, we also have the greatest motivation uh, to consider as well that we will stand before him. When we see him face to face, it will be a glorious day. But that day is accompanied by the sober reality that we will stand before him in judgment and that we will be judged according to our works. Those things done in the body, whether good or bad. Let me close with two warnings. Two warnings. One, there will be those who appear before the judgment seat of Christ 
who earnestly believe that they are Christians, only to find out there, exposed by their works, that they are not. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Peter would say, brother, sister, listen, be diligent. Be diligent to make your calling and election sure. How do you assure your heart before him? John gives us the answer in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. John says, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this, loving not in just word or tongue, but indeed in truth, by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. You want to make your calling and election sure, get out there and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Love your brothers and sisters, not just in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Preach the gospel. Share the gospel with the lost, right? By this, we shall assure our hearts before him. Second warning. There are those who are here today, those who walk in and out among us while a verdict of condemnation hangs over their head. John chapter 3, verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. The sentence has been handed down. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You want that sentence commuted. Put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. What if your time was today? What if you knew it, right? Sitting here as we think through these things. What if you knew the exact moment of your death? 2.45 this afternoon. 6 o'clock this evening. Next Wednesday at lunch. Two months from now, from a terminal illness. Right? What if you knew? What if you were given just a few short weeks to live? As the day drew near, if your conscience wasn't already seared, then you would be consumed with thoughts of what will happen next consumed with where you will be and what will happen, where you will end up. If that were the case, do you believe that you would be as careless with your soul as you have been to this point in failing to turn in repentant faith to the Lord Jesus Christ? If you knew that that day was coming upon you, would you be so careless with your soul? Would you not turn to Christ? Then you will face Almighty God, your Creator, the one who is ruling and reigning over you, the one who is sovereign over you. You will face God in judgment. You will face the verdict of His perfect holy, and altogether implacable law. Every thought, every deed exposed before him from your entire life to that point. I implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Turn from living life for yourself. Turn and trust yourself to him. Why will you die? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that you would turn from your sin and put your faith and trust in Christ. Beloved, you and I, let's live the Christian life. Amen? Let's live the Christian life. Preach the gospel. Love his church. In the light of the hope that's been laid up for, him, for us in him, 
in light of that day, but to live in such a way that we may have confidence and joy before him. Be bold. Be confident in Christ. Don't lose heart. Don't shrink back. Serve him faithfully, earnestly, diligently, zealously. He is worthy. Amen? All praise, honor, and glory to the one who justifies. Let's pray. 